so I was thinking about this question, the future of work, and thinking about a room full of college students. What are families and students perhaps fixating on or worrying about that actually they shouldn't be? And what are actually things they may be neglecting or not paying attention to that actually are going to make the biggest difference in their work and their careers? So we are at the point with my 15-year-old where we don't talk about it because he <laughs> refuses to. So that's probably <laughs> something we got to work on. Uh, but you know, the one thing we have been talking about and, and he has been bringing up is he's very concerned that he hasn't demonstrated uh, sufficient leadership. But I think the notion of leadership is being redefined. I think that leaders are used to leading from the front, and I think historically that's what we've seen, and I think the leadership model of tomorrow is side by side. Uh -huh. Leadership is advocating for a principle or a, uh, something you believe in, and leadership is you know, locking arms with the people beside you and bringing the whole group forward. Uh -huh. It isn't standing out there in front and then uh -huh. looking back and making sure people are behind you. Uh -huh. And so I do think that model is changing, and I think it's the expectation of a younger generation. Uh -huh. That's great. I'm going to take a different, different tack. So uh -huh. <clears throat> I've been a CEO in about five different companies over the last 40 years. And when I went to JCPenney, one of my pastor friends, we were having dinner one night, and he said, so what are you worried about? I said, I really don't like the way I sound when I talk to the people. I come on a Segway because I don't walk very well. You know, I just don't think I sound like what they want to hear. <laughs> so my friend who was a communications consultant said, uh, so maybe I could come listen to you say this stuff to your 800 people sometime. Yeah. I said, sure, I mean, that'd be great. So I get out the next time I'm there, he's in the back of the room, there's 800 people. I zoom out there with a segue, I, I do all the stuff about the earnings and this is what's gonna be good, this is gonna be bad, you're gonna love it, everything's wonderful. And uh, everybody left and I went back to the back of the room. I said, so what do you think? He said, I actually think you suck. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you basically just told them how smart you are and how they should be really uh, accepting you, and that's not who you are. Why wouldn't you do it a different way? Why wouldn't you love your audience, do your homework, and be yourself? And I said, what does that mean? Well, if you love the audience, you're not thinking about yourself, you're thinking about huh. them. Huh. You're not stupid, you're gonna basically do your homework. Huh. But being yourself is the main thing. Huh. They're gonna fire you someday if you're not yourself. And what I would say to you today as a meaningful work thing is being yourself and loving your audience is really how to run a company. Huh. I actually think there's something very existentially profound in what you're saying, which is we can look at all the changes that are surely ahead, many of which we can't really adequately see or anticipate. The biggest ones surely we couldn't name today on this stage. And we can either decide, well, I'm going to try to bend my shelf, myself into the shape of the future. But if you're bending yourself into the shape of what you think the future is going to be, that's very anxiety producing, not likely to work that well. And you've given us another picture, which is the best way to navigate whatever is coming in this future is, is love, <laughs> preparation, doing your homework, and being yourself. You know, I just want to add one other thing, and trust me, Mike, Mike did love the people, and he loved that company, and that's why he was there twice. I think you can bend, I don't think, you got to be careful you don't break. What you don't want to do is try to become something you're not. The most important thing in my mind, though, is to find your gift, to find your spike, and then figure out how to that, apply that in a modern world. And you know, when I started in, in uh, graduate school and I told my parents I was gonna get an MBA and they about fell over because I was pretty much a musician up until then. And people said to me, you know, you're not analytical enough to, to, to be in business. You can either let that advice drive you to, to break mm. or you can use that advice to think about, okay, well, how do I negate the negatives but push into my spike of creativity? And I think, you know, we all have a gift and I, you know, what I've tried to do even with my own children is nurture the gift and nurture the thing they show the most interest in. Trust me, there will be a way to apply it. Hmm. You both were involved in a company, uh, JCPenney, that uh, as you took it over, Mike, and as you joined the board, Mary Beth, and then eventually you had an executive role there as well, 
Like so many firms, it was in a sector that was rapidly changing. It had a business model that in some ways was not optimal. And yet, um, what happened in the years that you were there as CEO, Mike, was a, an amazing like rebuilding of the company. How did you do that together? Um, when, I, when I arrived, I had not planned to take another job. I was actually retired at the time. And um, my observation was that the 1,100 stores uh, each had managers, right? And they only cared about their bonus. Huh. They didn't care about the company. All they want to know is what their bonus. So we started to talk about leadership. It's not about your bonus. It's not about being a manager. Huh. Managers manage things. But leadership is really more longer term. So three years, five years. To do that, you have to envision what the company should be like during that time. So getting each, each store manager to think about how would, they, how would they think about their business if they owned it? And as a result, the company went to the 110 years of the company. It was the most successful period of the 100 years because they, the team basically embraced it as theirs. Huh. Moving from just a very narrow focus on what am I going to get out of this, what's my bonus, to what's the purpose of the whole environment that I'm in, and how do I contribute to that? Yeah, I, I really couldn't agree more with Mike. I think this is getting to be a much more important part of a company's value proposition, if you will, to you know people entering the workforce, and that is what does the company stand for, and how does the company purpose align with the individual's purpose? I, I see it at the Hershey Company because I see the founder mentality of Milton Hershey and the fact that you know, 30 cents of our dividend, every dividend dollar that we make, going to support the school in perpetuity for underprivileged kids, mm. that's the reason we're pulling into the parking lot in the morning. And when it's a bad day, that's the thing that pushes me to work a little harder. So I do think there's, a, there's this commonality of values and purpose that can propel organizations and, and groups of people forward. And it's just finding that common thread and being able to take advantage of it. I want to say this so I don't get cut off by the, by the time. Yeah. But my finest uh, opportunity at J.C. Penney was finding Mary Beth. She was a director that had never been a director. She came on the board, not only took full responsibility for being a board member, but she ended up being the chairman of the corporate governance committee of the company during the toughest part of J.C. Penney's existence. So she's a rock star. Okay, so I have to say something now. <laughs> Um, you know, I had been with uh, General Foods for five years when I had a performance review, and this is how it went. You know, you're good, you're very good, but you're not white and you're not male, and it shouldn't make a difference, but it does. Wow. That advice takes you one direction or another. You either let it freeze you and you can't move, wow. or it propels you forward. And the thing that makes the difference are the people who enter your lives. I think I was 40 years old when Mike put me on the board of JCPenney. Huh. I had never been on a board. It was a big company. I had my senior management say to me, why would you want to spend one more day away from your children? He took a chance on me. And everybody needs people in their lives that they can tell stories to their kids about. And one of the things I try to do is tell a story to my kids about people I admire. Because I think it's important for them to know the kind of people that have helped put food on our table and a roof over our heads and gotten mommy where mommy's gotten. And Mike Allman is at the top of that list. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. My goodness. So there's... I came in, many, many, maybe many of us thought we'd come in and have kind of a technical conversation. Um, and certainly technology and, and the technical things we do at work matter. But what I am really hearing from you both is this is actually a people conversation and a purpose conversation. We will come back in 2030 and have you on stage again. <laughs> we'll see whether there are any jobs left. Yeah, good luck with that. But I'm guessing... <laughs> 
I'm guessing that actually it will still be about people and about purpose and about the kind of lives that make that possible. So thank you for modeling for that for us today. Go out and uh, enjoy life in this world. Thank you.